Hi, my name is Melinda Price and um, I'm the director of the Gaines Center for the Humanities and I would like to welcome for our fourth episode of a, a new initiative from the Gaines Center called Over Yonder, where we talk to Kentucky artists and scholars about working while social distancing. And this episode is Crystal Gregory, who is a um, professor in the College of Fine Arts. And I was uh, calling, thinking of you as a fiber artist and whether or not that was an accurate um, description of your medium and you, and you were saying. Yeah, um, so I think it's actually kind of an interesting term, I guess, because it really depends on which generation of artists you are talking to who's at, who's claiming it and who is kind of distancing themselves from it um, so fiber the field um, and the discourse kind of comes from at least within the US it really started in the 70s with the feminist um, feminist art movements and women movements and um, there was a big reclam reclamation reclamation of uh, material during that time. So people started weaving and um, using textiles in all different ways and, and really kind of coined the term fiber. Um, but if you talk to anybody who's a little bit older than that, they'll mm -hmm. call themselves sculptors or painters. And I think that there was probably a time in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s where it was also kind of uncool to be <laughs> a fiber artist and people wanted to be much more... People um, immediately think of macrame. Exactly, yeah. Apparently and making a comeback. It's totally making a comeback. And the, there are some incredible contemporary artists like Jesse Herod um, who are using macrame in, and having these, you know, sculptor who uses textiles, but I'm not afraid of, I'm not afraid of fiber either. <laughs> So that was like a long explanation. No, 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 that was that was great. Um, because <laughs> you had pieces at a recent exhibit at the UK University yeah. of Kentucky Art Museum, and to me, you almost stole the show there <laughs> because I was so moved by the motion and the aesthetics of your of your work, and and it was almost like it was um, there was a transcultural. You like you could see so many influences. It was beautiful, yeah. um, and so um, anyway, uh, yeah, so. show was like was really big for me because it um, um, it was curated by Janie Wil Wilker. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that show was really big for me because well, at first it was just so well curated, um, and it brought together two or three artists that were of really different generations, um, two painters and myself. And it was the first time I'd ever been put in conversation with um, like these epic painters like mm -hmm. um, Judy Ledgerwood and Joan Snyder. So it felt like a, a really important um, show for me and I learned so much. So I'm really glad you liked it. I did, I really did like it. Um, so one of the questions that I've asked people so far, um, so in the beginning I asked people, was this their first pandemic? But then I got such a wide range of answers. I was wondering, I'm like, I can't. No, yeah, but it was a wide range of answers. So what would you say if, I, if, if you were asked that question? I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely my first pandemic, at least as, as far as like how much everything changed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It affected every single person I know differently, but like everybody I know and everybody's life really shifted. Okay. Um, and so when I think of pandemic, like that's the kind of, um, yeah, like the bigness of it that I consider. So this is the first time I've ever experienced anything like this. For sure. So can you tell uh, tell me a little bit about your home, about your works? Did you already have a workspace at home? No. So, to create one. Yeah, that's been that's been a big um, shift. You know, we're so fortunate being uh, at the School of Art and Visual Studies to have 
faculty studios and access to all of the facilities that the university art school has. Um, so I was very comfortable in my studio at, at school. Um, and then pretty quickly, you know, we, the building shut down and um, I had to move to the, this back bedroom, um, which, you know, our house is really small and it's, it was like the room that accumulated all the stuff anyway. So it's been a process to kind of like move things out so that I can move things in and anyway. Um, but the biggest thing was that I couldn't bring my loom with me because it's just so cumbersome. Um, and so I really had to shift uh, what I'm actually making. Um, and that's been challenging and super fun too. Like I, I got to take, um, I don't know if this will mess it up, but I got to take with me a portable um, knitting machine. So can you see it okay? Again. Yeah, so it's not something that I was really very practiced on at all. And so I got to spend a lot of time with it, kind of figuring out how to, how to, how to make it work, how to work, paint, make it work in my own studio practice. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that, so, so yeah, like I guess for the, I'm a weaver kind of by heart <laughs> or like in the, in the start of things, I'm a weaver. And so moving to a knit structure has been really different for me. It's, it's totally a different poetry. Like in the weaving, um, it's all a grid. So you have one set of threads that are under tension that are being passed back and forth with a weft, which is mm -hmm. uh, at a 90 degree angle. And it's creating a grid out of two kind of separate um, threads. But in knit structure, it's all loops. So it's one thread that that is looped on itself over and over again to create like a semi two dimensional plane. And it, it just kept feeling so, um, I guess, correct within the social system that we're mm -hmm. now in, like, we're so dependent on our the loop next to us for mm -hmm. the strength and the durability and, and the flexibility to be able to change and to be able to trust um yeah. and then the fabric in the end is it's not that it stretches so there it has all this pliability and flexibility um built into the system um so i just felt like that felt really um i guess poetic and then and then also being pregnant <laughs> it does feel like also kind of very connected to one body becoming two bodies and the growth of that adventure. Yeah. So um, that's where I've been spending most of my time. I'm working towards a show at the Mormon Gallery, which is in Louisville. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have actually a couple images, but these are um, some of the knit pieces I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And what I've done is, so like kind of continuing that thought about this um, connectivity and these loop structures, I've been playing a lot with casting metal into the um, textile itself. And um, is it so this similar is similar to like chain mail or is it slightly different? It's, it's different. It lo it's hard to maybe see in the image. Like if you look. Oh, I see it. It's almost like you filling in the openings in the in the in the knitting with metal. Yeah, so if you look like the chain that you're seeing mm -hmm. is actually the knit structure and this like spill or this kind of like blob in the center is pewter. So what I've I've kind of developed this process where I'm able to um, heat up pewter to a point that it's molten and uh, liquid in a liquid state. But not hot enough to actually melt the silk and the cotton that I'm, I'm knitting with. So, so yeah, so sort of like, again, continuing that, that thought about um, this, the, these loop structures and the, the kind of the durability of them, but also the flexibility and the reliability of, of 
the thread, I'm not explaining this super well, the single line becoming multiple loops that are all kind of interconnected with one another, thinking about metallurgy in the same kind of way. So we, we, you know, metal is everywhere and it's just been refined down to these individual properties. So kind of like spilling them out somehow is still connected to those social ideas of um, that, that are kind of like really vibrant right now with this pandemic and this baby, but, but I think maybe more clearly in the pandemic. Um, so then these pieces are cast into concrete again, kind of uh, as their substrate. So there, there's a spill of the pewter oops, um, in the center, and then there's another gray of the concrete behind them. I love these. I don't really have to love them too. They're kind, of, they're kind of like moody. Yes, they are. It's one of the things I found also intriguing about your um, show at the art museum. I mean, in part, your your preferred color palette also is mine. <laughs> um, so the woven or knitted thing I have, they I have something from these colors. Mm. But there's also something about, um, when I first saw your work, I immediately thought of, um, so when I thought of your work, I immediately thought of uh, uh, being in Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. The kind of fine mesh rebosas that you mm -hmm. find in the marketplace from indigenous women. Yeah. Um, so the, it was there's immediate connection to women's handicraft, mm -hmm. but also there's such a tremendous amount of motion and a lack of containment mm -hmm. because it flows over the side of the substrate. Mm -hmm. All those things are um, ideas that I think are re very relevant to what's happening now. Yeah. Right? We have women who are at home taking largely uh, responsible for the care of children and others. Mm -hmm. Also these questions of containment mm -hmm. and how do we develop in a moment where there's maybe no containment for this particular virus. So, yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I think that um, it's the social read on it is something that I feel really is empowered by, I think. Um, and, I, you know, the materials that I use, I kind of talk about containment and boundary through architecture, through like concrete and how um, through either cities or, or these domestic spaces, our lives are defined by these parameters. Um, but I think that that also kind of echoes out into, into these social systems that are somehow they're like invisible, but they're the most present thing yeah. as well. And I think you're right, like during the pandemic, there's so many, it, it really just puts everything into the forefront that, um, you know, I've had so many friends share with me that even though their, their relationships are usually 50-50, so much more of the domestic labor has just automatically la landed on them. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's like something that everyone had to kind of like re, re deal with you know, like reassess or reconfront um, because now the, like all of the systems that we've had in place for childcare and for um, it, any kind of care <laughs> has, mm -hmm. has just disappeared or been postponed or been canceled. So, um, yeah. So another question I have asked is about you know, with all of our concerns about safety, mm -hmm. um, what what are some of your, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing, safe places? You mm -hmm. know, I saw someone say that we should all think about, continue to to reach for at least emotionally all of those places that make us feel mm -hmm. a kind of safety. And I was wondering if you had been, if you had a safe place that you think about or that you yeah. go to in these moments. That's such a beautiful question. Um, I think, you know, I'm from California originally and lived in New York and Chicago. And so th the thing that I realize, especially now that everything's kind of like, 
all of the busyness has gone away and I've been, um, you know, sheltering at home a lot is I really miss the ocean. Like I, I miss the ocean. I miss big bodies of water. And um, so I think I've been doing a lot of uh, meditating and kind of like thinking about that. Um, and I think also just being really distant from both, both sides of my family. Um, the water is the thing that it keeps coming back to for me. Um, but I guess I could also answer that and that I, I feel super lucky that this pandemic is happening in a digital age. Whereas like, you know, during the Spanish flu, we, if you were far away from your family, you were, you know, far away from your family. So I do feel like I've been a lot, a lot more in contact with people. And so that's been creating some sort of safe space through um, taking the time to reconnect with, with people that I just really love. And even if they're far, they're... Um, so do, do you remember any home remedies when you were growing up? Oh, um, my mom used to make what's called special malts. And it was like the cure-all mm -hmm. for some reason. And now that I'm like older and I realize it's just a smoothie <laughs> and we have it basically every day, but she would, um, you know, it wasn't her habit to make smoothies. So she would get out the blender and put bananas and milk and I don't even know what else, but um, if you were sick, you got a special malt. And that was sort of like the cure-all. Um, yeah. That I asked the question about home remedies to ask if you have come up with any sort of home remedies to help you deal at this particular time. Mm -hmm. Anything you have started doing to at home to make you uh, thrive or maintain in this period? That's a great question. Um, well, I think, so I'm going to answer it, I guess, in two well, maybe three ways, and you can choose which which one you like. <laughs> but um, the first one would be social. My little sister teaches yoga, and she's in um, the East Village and kind of lost all of her classes because of the pandemic. So she went, she's been doing Sunday um, virtual Zoom yoga with all of our family. Um, so it's been so healing, really, to just kind of like, do certain postures and then be able to chat with people from London to LA to Portland, Oregon to Kentucky and New York. And so that's, that has really like been, um, yeah, really healing. The other thing we did is because we've always lived in an apartment, like this is the first time we've ever had a backyard, we've made a raised bed and we planted some vegetables, which have been very slow to come up, but they're starting to come up now. Um, so that's been also kind of like, yeah, really grounding and healing. Um, what did you plant? We planted, um, the garlic is doing the best. Mm -hmm. And we have some spinach that's kind of scraggly and some lettuce and the green beans are okay. Um, but what, you know, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so anything will be good. But, um, yeah. And then we have some potatoes. I think those might be doing well with all that rain. Um, and then the last thing, which is, I think also like a community kind of social practice is Ray Goodwin and I have been doing, um, a mask making initiative. So we've found, I think that we have like 27 different sewers around Lexington and Berea who have been making masks for the um, UK healthcare workers. And we made, we've made uh, over 1,020 so far. So that's been really great to kind of just like keep people um, making and feeling, feeling like they have some power in the, to help. Yeah, so I don't know, those aren't, those aren't like um, remedies that we take, but. How many masks did you say you've made? We've made, well, as of last Monday, um, 1,220. Wow, that's really and, great. Yeah, yeah. so, um, and we're continuing now, we're gonna start making masks for the um, 
pediatric clinic. So we we'll start making kids masks and um, yeah. So is there anything of all the, the things you have learned about, about yourself, about your community, what, what are the things you think you might keep? Hmm. I thought that's one that I was thinking about a lot too, um, since I read your questions. I think, and I've, I've, I've heard this on the radio too, people are talking about how time has shifted how, um, you know, we don't have commutes anymore and we, there's a lot of kind of like parts of our day that are taken away. And so it both feels like very fast and very, very slow. Um, but I think within that, I've been able to find a lot of reflective time and a lot of um, kind of quiet time. I mean, we'll see what happens when the baby's born. <laughs> that might change. <laughs> but but um, I'd like to keep that kind of I guess it's like a distancing in some ways, you know, like just keep, keep my time more sacred than it has been in the past and um, try to allow more for, for the space for silence. Cause I think that that's what's really helped me in, um, in developing this new work is thinking about had had my semester ended the way that we thought it was going to end it wouldn't i wouldn't have had any time in the studio um and i wouldn't have had any kind of quality space you know thinking time um so there are some silver linings that i would like to keep um but i'm also ready for to be around people again let me just um let me say uh thank you so much crystal for taking the time yeah. Today. I really appreciate it. It's been such a treat. I just want to, to always introduce um, my son, James. Hi. Hi James. <laughs> I'm going to start over and then you're going <laughs> to make a face. So, um, okay, fine. Okay, then you start. <laughs> you want to step in? So, I should say, um, I always like to mention that I'm social distancing. Um, with my 10 year old son, um, James Price, who also is tech support. Hi, James. You can say hello, Hi. buddy. Okay. 